This morning, it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Vince Bantu as our guest. Dr. Bantu is a unique blend of traits that are not frequently seen in a single person. He's a pastor and an evangelist, but he's also a theologian and a church historian. He's a linguist and a social activist. Vince is assistant professor of church history and black church studies at Fuller Theological Seminary, primarily working at Fuller's campus in Houston, Texas. There is elsewhere around the country and the world, he networks with a variety of African-American students, pastors, churches, there and in other urban settings uh, and around the, around the country, around the globe. Vince received his BA from Wheaton College. Uh, shout out to Wheaton. There probably are some Wheaton alumni watching this morning. He, then he went to Gordon Conwell for his Master of Divinity. He earned a THM from Princeton Theological Seminary before coming to Washington, DC, where he earned his PhD in Semitic and Egyptian languages from the Catholic University of America. His dissertation combines his, combined his interest in African-American Christianity, or rather African Christianity, and social identity. He has taught as a visiting or adjunct professor at some 15 institutions around the world, and currently is, an, is active teaching in five institutions in addition to Fuller. So he has a wide range of interests and uh, experiences, and they all coalesce in Vince's sense of Christian calling. And he fulfills a number of roles in, uh, in fulfilling this calling. Today, uh, we mainly want to hear from Vince about his story. And so uh, we're going to proceed to that, but we're going to ask him about his life, his experiences, uh, his scholarship, the journey that he's been on as an African American, as an evangelical, as a Christian, as a scholar. And after we've had an opportunity to uh, listen to um, Vince, then we'll have the opportunity to ask him questions. Vince, welcome. We are so grateful that you're joining us this morning from Houston. And to begin with, we'd love to hear about your early life growing up, how you came to faith in Jesus, and how all of those early experiences led you into ministry. Hey, well, good morning, Quinn, um, and everyone else. Uh, at National Presbyterian Church, uh, thanks so much for having me. And uh, yeah, it's a great, uh, it's a great honor and blessing to be with all of y'all uh, on today, and uh, especially for this series. And um, yeah, it's just a great honor. And uh, yeah, and, and uh, thank you so much for just uh, the warm introduction and and uh, just the ability to share a little bit about really what God has done in my life and uh, and family and and in my community. And so um, yeah, just kind of to speak to that, um, you know, I uh, you know uh, kind of going back to you know, uh, really how I first came to know uh, Jesus as my Lord and Savior um, was when I was a young kid. You know, I got I got saved at a young age. And, uh, uh, you know, I grew up in, uh, as you mentioned, Quinn, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and, you know, if any of y'all are familiar with, uh, you know, St. Louis, uh, you know, it's a really integral part to my kind of upbringing and, and background. My, my parents, my family is all from St. Louis, and uh, that's kind of a, a major part of it. And, um, you know, St. Louis is, uh, it's a lot like D.C., you know, uh, it's very uh, racially segregated. Um, you know, in D.C., we got the Anacostia River, which is a major kind of racial uh, barrier in the city um, that I, uh, you know, when I lived in D.C. for four years, kind of, uh, grew, you know, kind of lived traversing and, and crossing. Uh, and, um, and it was kind of a similar kind of thing in St. Louis. It's, instead of a river, it's a street that actually cuts the whole city in half. Uh, it's black on one side and white on the other. And it's also extremely uh, kind of lower income. Uh, you know, it's a bank desert and a food desert and education, healthcare, all that other kind of stuff. And on the other side, it's extremely wealthy. And so I, I grew up uh, just about a mile on the north side of that line, but grew up kind of going, uh, crossing back and forth. And uh, actually, you know, so, um, you know, grew up, I grew up in a biracial household. My mom is white and my dad's black. So I, I, off, I always kind of, uh, you know, was thinking about difference and, and culture and, and identity and how, you know, and I was just seeing how like kind of, you know, just the, there was just really these different worlds that were, that were right next to each other, but yet might, might as well have been on different planets almost. And was always thinking about difference. And, 
and uh, and the church that I grew up in was a predominantly white evangelical church, um, and it was on it was it was only two miles from my home. But again, it was like in a different con- it was on, it was in a different world, and they were coming into our neighborhood doing inner city outreach, and you know my mom was a single mom at the time and uh, taking care of me and my brother, and so they were helping us out financially, and and we so we ended up going to this church, and we so we lived in a in an urban black community. My mom's the only white person in sight, and uh, but we grew, ended up growing up going growing up going to this this white evangelical church, and that's where I really kind of grew in the faith uh, and was discipled, uh, you know, all through middle school, high school. And, you know, my, you know, ever since I made the decision to accept uh, Jesus as my Lord and Savior, you know, when I was like seven, eight years old, I had a strong passion for evangelism and sharing the gospel. Um, you know, I used to be in my, I used to be in elementary school, uh, sharing the gospel with like, you know, third and fourth graders, you know, and, and, and passing out tracts and, uh, and I just had a passion for it. Um, but again, like, you know, uh, a lot of my, a lot of my context for Christianity was in this white church that, you know, it was great people. They loved the Lord. They were loving on my family, helping us out. Um, but, uh, but didn't, you know, I think didn't have the tools really to help me think through or even think through for themselves about what it means to, you know, uh, empower people to follow Jesus as he's made them culturally. Um, but there was like a lot of ways in which actually, I think it, it unintentionally and inadvertently that, that Christianity was presented to me uh, as this kind of like white middle class American value system that was kind of just enmeshed with Christian theology and, and kind of, you know, just unseemingly see present them as the same thing. And so I was, again, growing up being presented, uh, you know, this particular brand of Christianity, but trying to bring that into my neighborhood and trying to share it with the homies and being trying to, I remember trying to bring them to church and uh, trying to share the gospel and, and they would just have this reaction of like, no, nah, man, you know, I can't do all that. That's not for me. And, and I even remember feeling like, there wasn't a place for my urban kind of culture, uh, you know, in in uh, in Christian theology and in, and in my walk with Christ. And I, I felt like I had to culturally assimilate uh, to to the, the socioeconomic and the culture of the you know church I was at. And so, uh, especially when I I felt a call to ministry uh, when I was in high school, and I automatically felt the sense of I want to I want to go and study. And I want to learn more about the scriptures and about theology. If I'm going to be in ministry, I want to be prepared for it. And so I was asking and I was, you know, asking around. And and uh, that's how I ended up going to Wheaton College, because someone told me, you know, I was the first person in my family to go to college. My, my, my mama, she didn't know, you know, where to, you know, what to do. And one day, just kind of providentially, someone said, um, have you heard of this place called Wheaton? Like, that's a good, you know, that's a place to go. And um, and I, you know, I remember trying to look for, you know, I'd be going to my college fairs in my high school and, you know, what nothing about theology. It was all about, you know, like welding or, or auto mechanic stuff or, or, you know, stuff like that. It was all kind of, you know, and that's kind of what cued me in. Another passion of mine is really trying to make theological education more available to, you know, other communities, you know, and, and it wasn't really in my community and in my, you know, even in my church, like it, it wasn't available, but, you know, someone had said Wheaton, and so, you know, that was the only school I applied to and got in and, and, and ended up going there. And it was really, uh, I, I felt, again, I felt this sense of like, I needed to culturally assimilate and really reject my culture, my identity of like the, the urban black hood kind of culture. Um, and it was actually, it was actually ironically and providentially through, you know, some really uh, great mentors who really kind of helped me see the scriptures in a new way when I, I like literally my first year at Wheaton that that God really spoke to me and, and I'll tell you the passages that God really used to speak to me on this issue was in Acts chapter 10 when when God was bringing to fruition the promises that he had made going all the way back to Abraham that he was going to bless all nations through his seed that all nations would be blessed and that you know God had been saying he's going to build a multitude of all peoples and that his salvation reached to the ends of the earth and that Israel be a light to the Gentiles that 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 comes to fruition in Acts 10 when we have the first Gentile believer uh, Cornelius who, who who gets saved and filled with the Holy Spirit but before you know at the same time God is working in Cornelius's life he also has to help prepare Peter for what he's going to do. And he, he says, kill and eat. And Peter's like, no, I'm not, I'm not touching anything that's unclean. And God says, and this was the word, this is really the, the, this is the, this is the passage on the words that the Holy Spirit spoke to me. That's at the core, kind of like Quinn was saying, it's really at the core of everything I do uh, in ministry and academia. Um, God, God told Peter, don't call unclean what I've made clean. And that's really what God was saying to me in that moment was that, Vince, you have called your people and your culture and your background unclean. You thought it was unclean and it's been presented to you as if it was unclean. But actually, I've made it clean through Jesus Christ. And so you have to embrace who you are. And that was a, you know, that was a very powerful thing for me. 
Um, you know, I remember, you know, at that time becoming introduced to like Christian hip hop and, and, and that was just, that blew my mind because I had never, I had never been exposed to that. Cause none, again, none of my homies growing up in the hood were like, you know, were active in church. So I just, I never thought that, you know, I could actually follow Jesus uh, and, you know, with a backwards hat on and, with, you know, pants sagging and, with a, and a, with, with a wave cap. Like I just had no, I had no context for that. And it was so, it was so freeing and empowering. Uh, again, kind of like Acts 15, the, the, the decision of saying that, no, you don't have to be circumcised. You, you're a Gentile Christian. You can be, a, you know, you be a Gentile, like, you know, Jewish Christians, you know, we, you know, we do Jewish culture customs, but Gentiles, you still remain Gentiles. And so, you know, there's, room in the body of Christ for people to stay who they are and, and not and even embrace uh, their cultures. Uh, and so that was really, um, yeah, that was really a, a powerful thing for me. And that's been a hard, a big kind of uh, thing at the core in ministry and evangelism. That's really a, a passion of mine is like people knowing that they can follow Jesus as he made them. And, and, and kind of with that being a, a core of my, my, my passion, you know, when I ended up going to seminary after college, I was at Gordon Commonwealth Seminary and, and I was, you know, specifically at their urban campus because I wanted to go somewhere that was like to train me for urban multi ethnic ministry uh, and share again sharing the gospel uh, in, in the urban context um, and for people in culture relevant ways. And with that being kind of my passion, uh, my first year in seminary, I ended up taking a class on early African Christianity. And that really connected to that overall kind of value I had because, um, you know, I had always been, in, you know, and again, I, I had a great time, you know, I, you know, shout out and like Quinn said, shout out to Wheaton uh, and, and Gordon Conway. It was a great experience. But, but I think one of the issues I had was, you know, even in theological education, I was usually kind of used to being presented Christian theology uh, as it developed in like kind of the European and Western world. Um, and usually like, you know, non like black or brown people come into the story usually in the modern period. Uh, and then there's this underlying assumption that Christianity really developed in the West and then then involved, you know, non white people in the modern world. And when I took this class, I, I was just blown away. And I was like, I was like, yo, that's crazy. Like, there's actually been black and brown people like, and theologians at the beginning of Christianity, like it, it wasn't just like post you know, European colonialism, but there's actually been black and brown Christians that have been a part of God's story, like since day one and, and have continued and they're still around today. And I was like, uh, yo, that is crazy. I had no idea. Um, and, and that's crazy that I had no idea because <laughs> I've been studying this stuff. And, and so I was like, oh, I gotta, I, that's when I felt the Lord say, you know, I want you to go in the, you know, in addition to being a pastor in the ministry and evangelist, I want you to go and get, you know, uh, go learn that stuff, go, go learn that stuff and share that uh, with the larger body of Christ, because, you know, that I just felt like, man, if, if more people, Christian and non-Christian, if more people knew how diverse the gospel is, you know, the gospel movement has been since day one, that would just change so many people's perceptions uh, again, because my heart is really again for people who say that Christianity is not for me. That that's a that's a white man's religion. That's an American religion. That's a Western religion. Whatever. It's not for my people. That 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 people who you know. And I, I think a lot of us in the Western context, we we might not be aware of that because you know, in evangelism or or whatever, when we're when we encounter people who don't want anything to do with Christianity in the white culture, it's usually more for like philosophical or political or theological reasons. Like I don't believe in those things or whatever, but, but I think a lot of people in the dominant culture don't know that actually in, in most black or Brown or, you know, in most Asian or African or Latino or indigenous contexts, the number one reason by far uh, why people reject Christianity is not because they don't believe in God or not because they don't believe in Jesus or not because they don't believe the things that the scriptures claim could have happened or could be true. Uh, but the number one reason by far is an identity reason. It's a cultural identity reason. It's a sense of Christianity is not for my people. My people, you know, believe in X, Y, or Z. Christianity is, a, is, a, is, is for white people. It's for Western people. It's for American people. It's not for my people. Um, and so, again, if, if people really understood that, then it would be, it would just change the game and it'd be a powerful thing for the gospel. So that's kind of what got me into that and brought me to D.C. So who are some of the early African Christians that you learned about that, uh, of course, everybody knows one, and we always think of him as a, as a European, and that's Augustine, because mm -hmm. he was classically trained, but he, he's from North Africa. Um, but who mm -hmm. are some of the others that, uh, that we've never heard of that you discovered um, when you took this, this class? It's fascinating. Yeah. Oh, 
Yeah, thank you. Um, it, it really is. And yeah, I mean, that was one thing that I, you know, I did hear about uh, a little bit. Yeah. And, and like you mentioned, like I would hear about like Augustine or Athanasius or Tertullian or, you know, uh, you know, Ignatius, like some of these like African or Middle Eastern theologians who were, you know, uh, who were clearly from these parts of the world. Um, but, you know, their 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 Africanness or their Asianness is always, you know, often downplayed, even in artistic renderings. And and so, uh, you know, that's so that's one issue. Um, but also, you know, I think, um, he, you know, one thing that was really great about when I moved to D.C., you know, I went to Catholic U and ended up doing my doctorate there. And and ever since then, I've really, uh, even in, you know, my book that's out um, and a lot of the scholarship I'm doing now, I, I really uh, love that at Catholic U that, you know, my studies since then and, and now have really been focused on theologians who wrote in like African languages and in, in, and in Asian languages. And I think that's even why some of those names are not even known. And so, like, while, you know, the names Augustine or Tertullian or, or, or you know, Athanasius are, are known, um, it, there's just so many contexts. I, oftentimes when I'll, when I'll share, I'll ask for a show of hands and say, uh, you know, how many people have heard the name Augustine or Martin Luther or John Calvin or Thomas Aquinas or, or whatever, and everybody's raising their hands. And then I'll say, like, all right, how many people have ever heard the name Shenouda or Ephraim the Syrian or Narsai or Georgis of Sagla? or a lot to Petros and nobody's raising their hand. And it's like, and it, and it, it could be, you know, people, any, any color, you know, any culture. And that, that kind of shows part of the issue, right? Part of the reason why people think, of, you know, cause sometimes people might say, well, why did, why would people think Christianity is a white man's religion? Like that's a silly thing to think, um, you know, but when we, when we look at it, examples like that and many others, it's actually not that ludicrous <laughs> why people would think, even though we know it's not true, why people would think Christianity is a so-called white man's religion because the white men of Christian history are known even by people who aren't even church historians um and so you know yeah it's just so great to see like a lot of these names uh like shenouda for example who is actually the greatest not not just in 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 Christ, as a christian example but who's the greatest writer in the history of the egyptian language period uh who was a fifth century egyptian monk who wrote in the coptic language he did theology in the coptic language uh and 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 again is it's great is the greatest uh, author in the history of that language. Say, in, in the same way, Ephraim the Syrian is a fourth century doctor of the church who wrote in the Syriac language and who actually did theology in the form of poetry. That's another interesting thing is that, you know, the way that uh, in some of these cultural contexts, they would embrace their cultural mechanisms and idea and, and ways of doing theology that was unique to them. And uh, that's actually part of the reason why his, a lot of scholarship historically wasn't kind to him and, and thought of it as like less refined or less intellectual because it was, it was through a, a Syrian form of poetry called Madroche that actually he it was unique to his cultural context in modern day uh, southeastern Turkey that he, you know, used uh, the, the Syriac form of poetry to do theology. Um, and it's just this beautiful examples of poetry that he that Ephraim writes on and other other theologians like in his cultural context, Jacob of Sarug and, and also Narsai and the Persian Empire was one of the you know earliest theologians that also wrote in Syrian poetry. Um, Georgius of Sagla. The Georgius of Sagla was a 14th century theologian uh, who wrote one of the first African systematic theologies called the Masafa Mystery, which means the Book of Mystery. And Georgius of Sagla is actually the first Ethiopian author whose name we know, who, who like wrote, you know, who, who we can identify because a lot of the literature before him was just translated material uh, or anonymous authors. So, you know, that's significant because he's not only the first Ethiopian author, but he's the first sub-Saharan African author in, in, in that whose name we know in human history again not just in church history in human history some of the and again it just it just it blows my mind because especially in the black community both in the U.S. and in other contexts people will say oh Christianity is a white man's religion that's not for black people that that was a religion that just enslaved us and all that kind of stuff and I'm like actually did you know that the first black author in history <laughs> the first sub-Saharan African author was a systematic theologian named Georgius of Sagala who wrote in the Ethiopian Ethiopian language, which which also is the only African writing system in use today, and is the only Black country that has never been colonized in human history. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I mean, those are a few examples, but yeah. So you've talked about um, the cultural differences that you experience from an early age, and and you've made reference to some of them. I mean, one obviously is music style or dress style or probably uh, language. Um, but then you also talked about um, worldview, I suppose, uh, that for, uh, for white uh, Western Christianity, uh, it's much more likely that we're going to have a pro the, uh, problems intellectually 
with the faith or the, the problem of evil or, or, or at least raise those kinds of things. And you're saying, no, that's not, that's not what it is in, in, uh, in the African-American uh, or, or minority cultures. Um, are there other things that we might not think about that are sort of obvious examples of the cultural differences that you found uh, really are incidental to the essence of the gospel? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's a great question. Um, you know, I would say, uh, like, for example, another thing I'm actually I'm actually, uh, you know, working on a piece right now for uh, Christianity Today that kind of, um, you know, is going to be exploring this in more depth. But w one thing, um, you know, that really, I think uh, it touches on a, a moment that we're in right now as a country, uh, you know, kind of with the uprising of like conversation around uh, racial justice and, and Black Lives Matter. And, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, especially the evangelical world that that might have a sense of thing and then not just now right this has always been an issue but there's been a lot of people who have a, a sense uh, or a question around like well our, our conversations or movements around social justice is that really like a, a gospel concern or is that really like you know there's even been some outright uh, expressions of rejection in the evangelical world of saying well that's that's not a gospel concern right like justice and social justice that's a that's kind of a socialist or kind of Marxist concern and that has nothing to do with the gospel right well, that's a that's a that's I would say that that's a concept that would be extremely foreign to uh, really the world of early Christianity as a whole, uh, but especially uh, in an African context. I mentioned Shenouda, who's you know the greatest writer in the history of Egypt, uh, and, you know, and and wrote in the Egyptian language. Uh, but he led a monastic community, and and actually Egypt is is seen as kind of the the, the fountain of you know Christian communal monasticism. Um, and they had their own unique style that actually Europeans later, ironically, you know, during kind of the Scottish and Irish missionary movements of, of later periods in the five and six hundreds actually in many ways borrowed from uh, that started in Egypt before uh, through Egyptians like Anthony uh, the Great and Pacomius and also Shenouda. And in his monastic uh, community, it was a center of theological education. You know, you, you were talking earlier about kind of uh, different values and different aspects of ministry and theology living together, right? Well, Shenouda was like that as well. He, it was a center of teaching orthodoxy and, 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 and doing evangelism against kind of Egyptian paganism. Uh, it was a source of, of literacy and education, uh, you know, where, you know, again, a lot of this, a lot of this literary production was going on. Uh, it was also a site of social and economic empowerment. Uh, one of the one of the draws of Christianity, especially in the monastic communities, was the ways in which it was able to attract low income communities, people who were poor, whereas the pagan traditions would often be more for the wealthy class who, you know, had to afford things like temples and mummification and libations and things like that. You know, the gospel's free. You just, you just, you just give your life to Jesus Christ. And actually, uh, instead of requiring things of you, it actually gave things to you. It actually gave opportunities to be, become literate, to uh, become uh, employed through arts and crafts, through carpentry, through agriculture, and also to have a home and a residence and a community. Uh, and also they were providing health care for people all throughout the Southern Egyptian community, especially for the elderly and for war friends and widows, um, and, and also were involved in uh, civil acts of, of, of uh, nonviolent uh, disobedience, and also uh, critique, uh, Shenouda would publicly critique uh, wealthy pa pagans uh, who were oppressing the poor. So it was a, it was a really holistic vision of church ministry, uh, much more like Acts 2, that was embracing the fullness of the gospel, of proclaiming the truth of scripture and the truth of Jesus, um, and, and, and also, uh, uh, and also uh, refuting uh, un ungodly religions or, or, or false teachings. But also it was one that, that very much embraced a, a holistic vision of justice and community development and prophetic advocacy. Uh, and so again, in his context, again, the idea that um, you know, justice and, and truth are somehow kind of, uh, or social justice and the work of the church are not, are not harmonious or don't go together would have been a, a very strange idea to, to someone like Shenouda. So when you're differentiating between uh, um, this ancient African uh, church or the church with ancient African roots um, and uh, the, the dominant Western white uh, view of the church, where do um, denominations like the AME and uh, and some of the Black Baptist uh, denominations in this country that are uh, predominantly or solely African American, where do they fit into um, the, this this picture that, as you see it? Yeah, that, that, I think that's a great question, and um, you know, I would say that uh, you know, you have like, I mean, 
kind of on this, you know, we, we, we've been talking a lot about kind of the, the early history of Christianity in Africa and, and Middle East and, and on this side of, you know, kind of the Atlantic and, you know, on this side of like kind of uh, Western colonialism and all that. We've had like these different churches, like you said, the AME and, and National Baptist and all these black denominations that have kind of emerged even in the context of slavery and oppression and Jim Crow that nonetheless have emerged even in spite of those things. Like, you know, uh, you know again, the AME in particular was founded uh, as an act of resistance to the racism and the segregation that was happening even in the church on Sunday morning in the Methodist church in Philadelphia where, you know, black folks like Richard Allen and Absalom Jones were literally physically thrown out of a church uh, for their defiance of the racial segregation. Um, and so I think that's another great example, uh, kind of like I was talking about a Shenouda, even maybe even without knowing it or uh, unconsciously, there was a there was still this more, I would say, holistic vision of, of, of Christian witness. Uh, I, I worked in, you know, uh, you mentioned in some different schools. And uh, in addition to being at Fuller, I also, I also uh, run a, an African-American seminary program called the Meacham School of Hymenote. And Hymenote is actually an Ethiopian word that means theology or faith or doctrine uh, and a kind of religion. It means all those things kind of encapsulated together, the, the mental, the emotional, the spiritual, and the, and the, and the practical kind of holistic. Um, but we're also, uh, the first word, uh, the first name in it is actually named after John and Mary Meacham, who were actually abolitionists and underground railroad activists and pastors uh, and evangelists uh, in St. Louis. They started the first black church west of Mississippi. Uh, and they were helping slaves escape uh, Missouri into Illinois freely. And they were also teaching black people how to read and teaching them theology when that was actually illegal in the state of Missouri. It was against Missouri law for blacks to know how to read. And these pastor, this pastor couple was teaching that uh, illegally, uh, you know, in order to empower black people to read uh, the scriptures. And so that that's, you know, just, uh, you know, and, and again, uh, same thing with, you know, uh, Richard Allen in Philadelphia and so many, uh, you know, Grimke in D.C. There's so many examples of, of in the black in the history of the black church of, again, of a holistic vision of uh, of the gospel that is, you know, again, both social and theological uh, all at the same time. And um, and I think that, you know, again, it's one of the greatest, you know, I think uh, passions that I have is to is to be able to, um, you know, uh, connect the, these 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 wonderful African American traditions with some of the uh, African roots of the of the gospel, uh, so that we can begin to even go further and deeper into again envisioning uh, you know kind of African conceptions of theology, um, and 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 as well like you know I've also shared some of these you know things with like Asian American or or other uh, cultural communities with some of the early Asian visions of theology as well, and that's not to the to the you know kind of neglect or the. Uh, the downplaying of also engaging in, and learning and celebrating some of the European, uh, you know, kind of contextualizations and expressions of theology as well. Um, but it's also just trying to uh, kind of put special, like Paul says in First Corinthians 12, giving greater honor to the parts of the body that has lacked it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. How did you find out that you were good at languages? Where, where did where did that happen? Was it lear like learning Greek uh, in, in college or seminary, or, or um, what was it? How did how did you discover? Because um, you probably didn't have a whole lot of foreign language uh, classes growing up in St. Louis in the public school system. There. Oh yeah, not at all. <laughs> yeah, that. Um, yeah. Oh man, I didn't. Even, I remember when I graduated high school. I didn't even know how to use a computer uh, by the time I got to college. And yeah, you know, and this is still the, the two thousand, so it wasn't like it was like that long ago, but. Um, but no, my, my public school system and, and growing up was, was a little, it was a little rough. Um, but yeah, and it's, it's crazy too. And I appreciate the compliment, but honestly, I'm, I, I'm not so sure I am really all that good at languages. Uh, you know, I, I learned them and I dedicated my, my career to learning them. And actually, you know, I, you know, when I was a Catholic over there, I, um, you know, I, I, I focused on Coptic and Syriac. And then since then, I've been also, you know, working on Ethiopic or get is. And then, uh, and then right now I'm actually uh, wrapping up learning Arabic. Um, and that's, that's kind of a side note, but another project I'm working on right now is I'm, I'm like doing a project, a research project on exploring the spread, uh, the potential spread and connections between early Christianity in East Africa and how that may have connected and how that actually did connect in other West and South African contexts, even pre-colonialism. And so I want to be getting into Arabic now to do that. And then, um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm still, so I'm still learning. I'm a lifelong learner. Um, but it's crazy because, you know, I wasn't really like good at it. 
Um, and in fact, I really struggled when I was at Catholic U as a graduate student, and I almost didn't make it, actually. Um, and it was really by the grace of God and God showing up in a powerful way. And I remember when we lived in D.C., I always have, I always have a strong connection. D.C. has a special place in my heart. Anacostia, uh, you know, that was really where we, you know, my wife and I lived because my daughters were born there. Uh, you know, I had a daughter born at one at Georgetown Hospital, one at Inova in Alexandria. So I have a strong connection to D.C. Not only that, because also D.C. has my favorite food on planet Earth. I, all my favorite, my favorite, my top, just quick shout out. If it, this is, I lo- again, kind of like how I love showing hidden aspects of the body of Christ in church history i also love i also love showing hidden gyms and restaurants and so dc's got all these famous restaurants but i find so many people do not know about mgm roast beef if you guys have ever have never heard of mgm roast beef it's up in the brentwood neighborhood uh it's right by it's on the red line right by the rhode island stop oh my gosh their sandwiches are so great they're off the chain but so those are the two reasons why dc has a special place in my heart but when i when i lived there though um i had a rough time and i almost didn't make it and, and, you know, I, 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 you know, I never would have thought, and I'm, and I honestly still don't know if I'm really actually good at them. Um, but I just, I just, you know, dedicated myself. I diligently, I mean, I had two little babies. I was like, I was translating languages and had holding bottles and my wife was working and it was, it was rough. Um, and even now I'm trying to learn, but, but, you know, I just, I, it's more, again, it's, it's, it's like every day I was doing it then and now, and I was wrestling and grappling through it, trying to get these languages. Um, it was just all about, it, for me, it was motivated by this is this is for the gospel. Uh, I, I'll tell you, Quinn. There's a time where I was speaking at a conference one time, and there was a uh, an African American woman who came up to me after the conference after I was speaking and said, "You don't know me. You don't know uh, you know like uh, anything." But I've been I've, I've you know read some of your stuff. I've heard I've heard what you said. I had no idea about early African Christianity. I had no idea. I thought Christianity started for Black people through slave ships. I thought that was the, the beginning of mm-hmm. our origin of Christianity. And I had rejected the faith. And when I went and read some of the stuff that you pointed me to, that actually brought me back to the faith. And that actually kept me in the, in the gospel and kept me from like rejecting uh, Christianity. And, and I was just like, I was so moved and humbled by that. And, I, and that's why I was thinking like, I got to, <laughs> as hard as these languages are, I got to keep going and I got to keep doing it um, because the devil is a liar and, and he is trying to put so many lies in people's minds and again, use cultural identity as a, as a way of alienating people from the gospel and speaking this lie that the gospel is not for people. And so that's actually another project I'm working on right now with it's going to be a translation project with, um, you know, University of California Press, myself and a team of translators. Uh, several of which actually are our colleagues at Catholic U um, and people from around the world. We're actually going to, for the first time, going to put a, uh, a bunch of these texts, you know, Chinese, uh, Arabic, Armenian, Ethiopian, Nubian, uh, you know, languages I'd never even heard of, like Sogdian and Uyghur and all this kind of stuff, like all these different languages are going to be translated, Some, many of which for the first time ever are going to be translated into English and put all into one one place and the re and I'll the last thing I'll say real quick about that was the reason I actually and this actually came from black churches this was a and this was a this is a research project that that came out of uh that that really comes out of a, a need I'm hearing in the church and also is seeks to serve the church um because as I've been sharing more and more of this kind of stuff a lot of black pastors have told me yeah like you know Vince how can I get some of these uh these African and Asian you know theologians and church fathers and church mothers so we can also start sharing them and even do devotionals in church and really help people start to know <laughs> and then one thing they and I started realizing is that it's hard to get this stuff <laughs> because it's not it's not well known and so a lot of it is hard to get I mean you can go on your phones on your iPhones just a click away you can get the writings of John Calvin of Augustine of Martin Luther of John Jonathan Edwards of, you know, all these other European theologians, you could get them on your phone right now. But, you know, Georgius of Sagala, that that great, you know, first African book, it's not even in English. It's only in Italian. It does. So you can't even read it. And so that's when I was like, oh, man, that's when I got my next kind of mission. And so that's with this project with Cal Press that we're working on. And that's going to include Georgius, uh, a partial translation that I, you know, and, uh, and some, uh, like some of them for the first time and others uh, that, aren't, uh, that are in English. But the other problem is that a lot of these stuff, if they are in English, it's like in these really expensive university press publications and, and it's just really inaccessible. Uh, you know, so this, you know, so that's really kind of, you know, uh, why I keep pressing through my, my, you know, my, my, my struggles with languages. I keep, you know, I keep on trying to press through for the gospel. Wow. So this is not just a, a, a scholarly ivory tower uh, kind of concern of yours. Um, it, it just, it permeates your whole sense of your identity as a Christian, as a pastor, 
um, and you sort of bring it all together. And so um, uh, I think that's, that resonates a lot with me, the scholarship is really in service of the church, um, but in such practical ways. One of the questions in the Q&A is, you know, is there an anthology of poetic forms of, uh, of, of theology Egypt in, in some of these languages? Um, and uh, I don't imagine that there is an English translation. Um, and then the question, uh, the questioner says, uh, if there isn't one, why don't you publish one? Well, it sounds like you are. So uh, particularly, uh, uh, so this is our friend Elliot, who uh, is a professor of English at, and literature. Um, what about the, po the poetry, um, the, the, this uh, Syrian uh, writer who, who, who wrote theology in the form of poetry? Will any of that get translated? Yeah, that's going to be in there. So we, you know, uh, you know, the, it's going to, it's going to be a reader of primary text, and it's going to be the greatest hits, like the greatest, most prolific theologians in all these different languages. So like I was saying, like, you know, uh, is Syriac is going to be in there. One of my homies, you know, one of my, one of my, my homies, he does like Syriac and Arabic. He's doing those. I'm doing the Ethiopian and the Coptic ones. You know, we got, we got one of the top scholars in the world doing Nubian, uh, you know, uh, Chinese, uh, like I said, Uyghur, Persian, all that. We got all those different languages. And and here's the other great thing, exciting thing, is that there are also two other similar works that are in, that are in the works right now. Like I said, there's there's nothing like this in existence right now in scholarship. You know, there's there's some translations in English of some of this stuff. And Ephraim the Syrian, thanks to the Lord, uh, he's the greatest writer in that form of Syrian poetry and theology. And there have been, and there are some affordable translations of his stuff, you know, like uh, his hymns on paradise, his hymns on faith, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, my old Princeton advisor, Kathleen McBay, actually did back in the 80s. She did a nice, thick, uh, you know, uh, English translation, of a lot of his particular hymns. But again, there's nothing like what you're saying in anthology, but there's, you know, Praise be to God. Now, see, my the Lord had to humble me a little bit because uh, I was sharing. I, I I had this idea and I was so excited about it and I was having all this sense of grandeur, like man, it's gonna be amazing, da da da. And it's gonna be the first one ever. And then like, and then I I was talking to a, a homie of mine and he was like, actually, yeah, Vince, that's what's up because you know what? There's like two other works like that going on too that are in the works now too. And at first I had this pride for rack, like, oh man, I thought I was gonna be the first one. I thought mine was gonna be the only one. But then the Lord had to humble me, and then I real, and then. I was able to connect with the editors of these two other projects that are happening right now. And we were able to coordinate to make sure that we're all having different texts. So there are three anthologies of early, well, two of them, two of them are going to be uh, like, like the one I'm doing and the, and the other one, this, this, this friend of mine, um, that I actually knew from Prince and he's doing a similar kind of thing that it's going to be different languages, you know, all these different kind of early Christian Afri uh, African and, and Middle Eastern languages. And then there's another, that's two of those, mine and his. And then there's another person I know who is doing one that's just on, just on the Syrian uh, literature. It's going to be a, an anthology of Syriac primary text. So there's three, there's none right now, but there's three that are going to be hot off the press real soon. Uh, wow. And the greatest is of the people we've never heard of. Um, <laughs> that's that's wonderful. And so this uh, volume that you that Kathy McVeigh edited, I believe that's in the classics of Western spirituality, which is really mm -hmm. interesting that it's it's in a series called Western spirituality because it's Eastern, but at least it's out there and uh, it is I think now available in paperback. And so that's affordable. Mm -hmm. We're sort of moving into um, the, the the questions and answers. And so I think we'll just continue to. Um, make that transition. Have you studied Coptic Christians of Ethiopia and Sudan? And it sounds like certainly Ethiopia, but what about Sudan? Oh, yes. That's, that's such a, oh man, that's such a powerful uh, history in Sudan. I mean, Nubia was, I mean, New, you know, Kush is one of the most referenced nations in the scriptures, right? I mean, they come up so many times in the Old Testament. You know, we see a Kushite believer, he's called an Ethiopian, but we see a Kushite, you know, believer of Candace in Acts chapter 8. There's such a powerful history there. But Nubia actually became a Christian nation in the, in the 6th century, in the, fifth, in the 500s, uh, and was a Christian nation for a thousand years. And, 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 during, and this is especially an interesting thing I love to share in the black community, uh, both on the continent of Africa and in the diaspora, because, you know, there's a lot of black Muslims and a lot of them will say things like, well, no, Christianity is a white man's religion. And I was, I was, you know, I was teaching some of this stuff in Senegal and it was so powerful because I did, I had no idea. I had no idea until I went there that Senegal is like 95% Muslim and, and, you know, it's like 5% Christian. And, and I went to live, visit the house of slaves on Gori Island. And that was the first, you know, structure built by Europeans, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in Senegal, 
and there's a church there. There's a church in the slave house where Africans were being rounded up and stripped from their families and, and treated le even less than animals. And then, and there was a, and that's, there's a church in the midst of it and showing how the, Euro the Portuguese and the other Europeans there, how it was like, you know, the missionaries and the slave catchers were working hand in hand. Uh, and so it's, again, understandable why, you know, people in Senegal, for example, like it's very common to say Christianity, you know, that it came here through these slave castles and through slavery. So we want nothing to do with that. Um, and uh, whereas Islam is like the dominant religion and that's seen as the, the religion of Africans, right? That that's seen as the, as the black religion. And so they, these pastors that were in this class were just like, you know, again, they were, they were saying, this is game changing. Like we, we had no idea. And, and they were saying, this is going to be like so powerful for so many people in our country who, again, they think of Christianity as the white imposed imperial religion. And Islam is actually the religion of black people. When I was sharing with them the Nubian history of Christianity, that actually, again, they, Nubia is one of the oldest black nations. It's the oldest black civilization uh, in the world. It's one of the eight, most ancient African civilization. And it freely embraced Christianity. So while, while yes, unfortunately, you know, slave ships came to Senegal and, and built slave castles, uh, so-called in the name of Jesus, that you know, even a thousand years before that, Christians in Nubia, kings and queens of Nubia freely embraced Christianity without any colonialism, without any coercion, without any imposition. They freely embraced Christianity as the national religion. And even when you look at like Nubian architecture and, and history and archaeology and literature, it's predominantly Christian. If you look at the history of the Nubian language, it's predominantly Christian theology. So that shows that like the gospel is at the core of African history and African literature. Um, and, and also uh, the thing about that too, especially re with regard to Islam, is that uh, when the Muslims came in in the 600s and conquered Egypt and conquered North Africa, they attempted to come into Nubia as well. And Nubia was actually the only country in the seventh century that successfully fought off the Muslims. The Muslims conquered Persia, the Eastern Roman Empire, North Africa, but the Nubians were the only ones that defeated them in battle. And they, and they created a peace treaty where Nubia, while Egypt remained under Islamic control, even though it's predominantly Christian, uh, Nubia would remain a, a free, independent African Christian nation um, that, you know, again, was lasting for a thousand years. So yeah, there's a powerful history there. Wow. Well, we're getting an education this morning. What, what, here's another question. Um, and it, it's, a, it's about the impact of art uh, and primarily Western art, the depictions of uh, Madonna and Child, of Mary and Jesus. Uh, it, it, they're pr predominantly white portrayals. And, and of course, um, that, that certainly couldn't have been the case. What's, what's the impact of that on uh, the non-white church, the black and brown church in America? And are there, other, are there any artists that you know of who have or who are working on um, portraying Mary and Jesus uh, and the early church with racial characteristics that they m most likely had rather than uh, the predominantly white ones from European art? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, uh, uh, both great questions. I mean, I would say, um, I mentioned in my testimony, you know, that I, I internalized, I struggled with an internal belief that, that Christianity, you know, was a white religion um, and that, you know, and that, that uh, and that in order for me to be a good Christian, I had to assimilate to white culture uh, in order to be a good follower of Jesus. And, and here's the thing is like, you know, I grew up in a church where they people, they love Jesus. They love the Lord. They're, you know, they were really, you know, good people. Uh, and yet, you know, they, you know, so they never like sat me down and told me that. Nobody ever told me, you know, if you want to be a good Christian, you'll be a white one. Um, but at the same time, you know, they told it to me. They actually did say that without saying it in a thousand small ways uh, and, 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 and in some of them not so small. And that's a great example of that, right? Is seeing, you know, <laughs> pictures of Jesus that look like, you know, that look like Thor uh, rather than like a, a Palestinian Jew from the first century, you know? And that's, a, that's just one of many examples, right? Um, you, know, uh, uh, I, you know, like I have a friend, uh, Dr. Sun Chan Rao, he, he uses this example a lot uh, in his writings that, you know, and this is a few years back, but there was a Time Magazine article that, that the cover page said the top 25 most influential evangelicals in America. And, I, and out of the 25 of them, 24 of them were white men, uh, were mm. white. So, and one of them was a white woman. And then, you know, one of them was a black man and 23 of them were, were white men. And so like, that's another kind of indirect way uh, or, or direct, <laughs> you know, of saying like, you know, again, it's not 
silly for someone to say, oh, I guess evangelicalism is a white man enterprise because you're saying, you know, you're saying 23 out of the 25 top leaders are white men. So, you know, and, and so it's all these, so I would say that's the effect really of, um, you know, of, of not just the depictions, but also of so many ways in which, uh, w which um, you know, white, white expressions of Christianity are, are presented as normative, right? I mean, even the way that often it doesn't get labeled, right? I mean, how many times do we, how many times do we culturally label things that aren't white, but we remove labels of things that are like we'll say black church or black theology or 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 chinese we'll even do it in non-theological stuff like chinese restaurant or I, I had chinese food you know uh or but you know i or mexican food or indian food right but we don't say white food or white music or white theology or white church there's a resistance of saying that right no 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 like it's not white it's just normal mm -hmm. <laughs> right? that's actually very uh that's actually very uh, uh you know kind of a dominant oppressive way to think that you know non-white things are culturally specific but white things are just normal uh and and therefore with theology done you know through white lenses are just normal and so that's why we have to really be able to contextualize and thankfully there are many artists today who are you know showing uh both showing artistic depictions of biblical figures in a way that are more culturally and probably historically accurate uh to what a palestinian jew likely looked like but also there are artists that are also do you know taking like kind of uh, artistic license in expressing like Asian depictions or African or you know depictions or native indigenous expressions of Jesus uh, as a way of not making a historical claim but also a more a theological claim of showing how Jesus connects with all people and that we're all made in his image um, and and the, the, again the beautiful thing last thing I'll say about that the beautiful thing about this early history is that that was already there and it, it's not like a post-colonial response uh, or anything but it was just already there like you can see ancient depictions in ethiopia of jesus and mary and angels with afros and with black skin uh with african features and also actually going back to nubia the cover of my book multitude of all peoples actually has a picture that i found that just blew me away um it, it had actually you know a, a nativity painting of mary and jesus looking african and also there were actually people uh next to him in this painting in this monastery from the 10th century in Nubia, there's these African figures next to Mary and Jesus in this painting who are celebrating the birth of Jesus, but they're wearing African animal masks. And they're also, you know, playing percussive instrument and wearing African dashikis. And that's just, you know, a powerful, you know, ancient expression of, you know, representing biblical figures and angels and, and African figures in uniquely African ways that is, that goes back to antiquity. Yeah. It, it, another, uh, comment in, in the in the Q&A um, points at uh, the identity and portrayal of Moses by Charlton Heston in the, that that well-known you know Hollywood classic movie the Ten Commandments which uh, most Easters uh, it gets aired somewhere and uh, who of course Moses uh, was he was born in Africa he was raised by Africans he's married to an African, um, and and yet uh, until this came up, it never occurred to me that that that's you know how a lot of people um, you know visualize Moses uh, if if they're not um, if they're not thinking about it. Uh, here's a kind of a really broad question, and uh, but what are the roots of the rejection of the social gospel by the white evangelical church because uh yeah that i mean then, of course that gets into 19th century american church history and, and whatnot but what's your sense of that and then and then yeah. what about the the, the non-white churches uh relationship to the social gospel yeah i think that's a great question um i mean you know i would say um I would say that, and again, like it's not my area of expertise much. Although I am working on another, 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 another book uh, with right now uh, with Urban, Minist Urban Ministries International Press, uh, and it's actually uh, a text that you know it's called Gospel Hymenote, and uh, you know it's kind of um, you know like uh, presenting a, a theological perspective that that we're you know myself and other uh, I'm editing it as other black uh, theologians uh, where we're kind of uh, pro kind of promoting a perspective that we're calling a gospelist perspective. Um, and so I have got, I have dabbled into that issue a, a little bit, um, you know, and uh, my, you know, my sense of it, honestly, is that the, um, the, the kind of the, the, I would say, honestly, what I would call the bifurcation of the gospel is really a, um, is a dilemma 
and is a struggle that is really kind of a, like a white struggle, honestly. Um, you know, and it's like largely, you know, again, I mean, I'm generalizing here, but it's kind of a uh, it's kind of a struggle between emphasizing the truth, the universal truth of the gospel and kind of individual righteousness and purity uh, versus like a, a social and kind of justice oriented God. And we've seen for over a century now, we've seen Western white American and white European Christianity be really rendered in half, whether it's seminaries, you know, I mean, I went to Princeton Seminary, so there's a history there, right? The battle for Princeton and then Westminster Seminary coming out of that. And then, you know, uh, there's like denominations that have split. There's, you know, nonprofits that have split uh, and, and, and emerged out of like a more so, like social, and even like social gospel versus fundamentalism, right? There's like the fundamentalist modernist split, uh, you know, in the early 20th century. But again, I would argue that that was really, that's, that whole split between again, focusing on, well, is it about truth or is it about justice? I would say that's really like a, a, a binary that really exists mainly in, in white people's minds um, and, 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 and white people who are in charge of church structures that have reimagined and revisioned Christianity and the Bible in that kind of like narrow perspective. But again, I think one of the reasons where, uh, where, where our brothers and sisters in the dominant culture could stand to listen and learn from a lot of black and brown theologians is that that, that kind of bifurcation is not really present in the black church. Again, we were talking about the black church, uh, you know, in the AME and like the origins and even still now, um, I mean, <laughs> we see voting pattern differences between the black church and white evangelicals that might share similar theology, like conservative evangelicals that might have similar views of scripture and, and different things like that as a lot of black, black Christians do. And yet, we vote rad radically different uh, because there's still in the black church uh, in large part a theological conservatism but also a, a social progressivism and and uh, commitment to justice and so it really wouldn't be a in our minds it's not a social gospel it's just the gospel <laughs> which is like you know which embraces you know again concepts of truth and justice that are uniquely and that's the perspective that we're you know really advocating uh, that's the perspective of Richard Allen or Jarena Lee or Mary, uh, John and Mary Meacham or, uh, you know, Grimke or a lot of these uh, African-American theologians that, that uh, again, you know, uh, really embrace, uh, you know, really the truth of the gospel and also justice as well. So just a very uh, practical question, or maybe not so practical because it's about these uh, obscure works that you're translating. Um, and hopefully they won't be obscure much longer, but what are the names of these volumes that are coming out? You see, you mentioned you've got one and there's two others. Uh, are, are they all University of California Press or, or, or do you know? Uh, how can we look yeah, for that's a, Yeah, I, I think, um, I think that, I think that uh, one of them, um, one of them is the one that's just looking at Syriac. That's one of, the, I know one of the editors for that is a friend of mine named Scott Johnson. Um, and he, he'll be one, I think that has two or three editors on that one. I don't remember what publisher they're working with off, uh, right now off the top of my head, but that one is going to be, uh, that, I think that one's um, getting closer. That one's closer to being done, uh, certainly than ours. Uh, the one that I'm editing is, uh, co-editing with a friend of mine is going to be University of California Press. Um, but then the other one that Scott Johnson is doing, I don't remember the press, um, but look for his name. And also that one's looking at Syriac. It's going to be translating Syriac literature. Um, and then, um, and then the third one is, um, is a, is a colleague of mine. I think his name is, uh, James. I, I want to say his last name is Walters. Um, and I, I want to say they're, they're working with, um, Eardman's, I think, but I'm not, don't quote me on that part, but, um, but that one is also going to be, you know, early Christian texts, uh, that's more broad as well. Um, yeah. We've talked about languages. We've talked about your interest in, uh, the, Historic Church in Africa. Um, I want you to say a little bit about your name. How many Bantus are there in the phone book in St. Louis? Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, not not too many. Uh, it, it, you know, it was it was cool actually. I uh, after I changed my name to Bantu, I I, uh, I when I traveled to South Africa, actually, I, I didn't know I didn't know this before I went there, um, and I was in the uh, apartheid museum, and I. Uh, and I learned that Steve Biko actually, that Bantu was his middle name. And uh, it was Steve Bantu Biko, the, the anti-apartheid activist from the 70s. And, and I was like, oh, okay, now that's kind of cool. Because it's actually, a lot of my African friends tease me. They'll actually tell me like, you know, that's not a name, right? And I was like, I know, I know it's not a name. So, so um, how but, did uh, you come with that name? And, and, and when did you change it and why? 
Yeah, well, actually, that's another reason. I should have mentioned that earlier because that's another reason why DC will also always be a uh, a special place in my heart because I actually changed it at City Hall in DC was the place where where I felt I got my freedom papers, so to speak. Um, but yeah, I, my my family name was Campbell, you know, which was a uh, you know a Scottish name on my dad's side and not a whole lot of Scottish blood, uh, you know, on my dad's side of the family. So you know, um, I honestly that was something I thought about that ever since I was a kid. And you know, most Black folks, especially my generation, you know, your parent at some point your parents sat you down and made you watch Roots, you know, from the 70s. And that was like your education into the history of slavery. And I remember that part in Roots where, you know, Kunta was being whipped and they were saying, your name's not Kunta, it's Toby. Um, and that was when I first learned the history of like black people having these, you know, anglicized names because of slavery. And that often the last name was the name of the family of the the people that own your ancestors. And, and so even ever since I was a kid, I was like, oh, I don't like that. I don't like that I, you know, have like a, a name that's like really not our families. It's not our ancestors, but it's like a, you know, um, it's a, you know, it's a slave owner. And, um, and so, so I, um, I always wanted to change it, but I just never got around to it. And I remember even being in college, I had a lot of, I had a lot of Asian friends in college. And I remember a lot of them had like Asian last names. And I was like, I like that. Cause you know, you can feel your, you know, your, your culture through your name, you know, you just know it. And we, our names have been stolen. And so I always wanted to change it. Um, but then fine. And, and even when my wife and I got married, I had told her about this idea. I wanted to have an African name, but you know, I, I always thought maybe I'll try to go back and study my ancestry and see if I can go back to Africa. And, um, but when we had our first kid, we like, all right, we need to hurry up and do this. And so uh, we, you know, we did like DNA tests and cause I don't even, I didn't even know my own grandfather. So I couldn't, I obviously couldn't, you know, and I don't honestly think any black person can go all the way back to Africa. Cause it's not like they took our names down <laughs> on the slave ships, but um but I, I definitely can't because I don't even know who, I didn't even know my grandfather. But, um, but, uh, but, you know, so I tried doing the DNA tests and I was like inspired by Henry Louis Gates's uh, thing that he did back about 10 years ago at African American Lives. And, um, and, and my DNA results were through my dad's side were kind of all over the continent. It was like, you know, you have, and you know, they're just making these kind of genetic guesses. Like you, you come from these populations in these areas, but mine was kind of spread out. And they were saying that in the case of people of African descent on this side of the Atlantic, there, that's a lot of that's because of the Bantu migration, uh, the kind of the migration of people across Africa thousands of years ago. And that's why many different sub-Saharan cultures are, you know, called Bantu languages like Swahili uh, or, you know, uh, Lingala or Zulu or all these different languages are called Bantu languages. And, and so I kept seeing this word pop up and I was like, oh, it's kind of like a pan-African word. So even if I don't know exactly where my ancestors were from, it's like, you know, they were Bantu people wherever they were. And the word actually means people. Uh, Bantu means people. I mean, and that's where like kind of Ubuntu Desmond Tutu's uh, kind of theological worldview or paradigm really is related to that of common humanity. Um, and, uh, and so that's kind of in, in South Africa and apartheid, it actually, it became like kind of a, uh, like a kind of an epithet for black people, in particular, you know, people, but in the sense of black people. And so, uh, so anyway, that's kind of, I, you know, I wow. thought that would be a good thing. It would be kind of an embracing of, of all of our, you know, African ancestry. Fascinating. The time has flown by. Um, I guess we'll just have to have you back. Oh, maybe when your book is ready to come out in 2022. Um, and uh, please, God, may it be in person um, when you, so you could make a trip back to, uh, to this very important place uh, in your life. Um, the last thing that there is to do is, is, is to pray. Um, and uh, I want to pray for our congregation because we've got work to do, but I also want to pray for you and the work that you're doing. So I'll invite uh, folks to join me in a closing prayer. Gracious God, thank you for this time, uh, for all that we have learned from Vince, for his passion, his energy, his deep commitment to you, and to blending the, the life of the mind with the life of the heart and uh, with an active faith that probes and questions and uh, does not let uh, assumptions continue, but uh, seeks to find the deeper history, the deeper meaning. Uh, would you, uh, Lord, continue to work in your people at National Presbyterian Church as we uh, grow in our understanding of what it means to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ in the world in which we live? Um, and in this particular season in which we find ourselves. Um, and would you bless Vince in the work that he is doing, the vital work of uh, bringing to light and into print uh, in English translation, uh, some of these seminal works that we are just ignorant of. Uh, 
um, and for all the work that he does to share Jesus with people who are uh, culturally disinterested, um, and for the equipping that he does of uh, students and pastors, particularly in urban settings in the African American church. Uh, Lord, make him uh, a fruitful vessel, sensitive to the leading of your Holy Spirit. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who died for the whole world. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us, Vince. It's been a pleasure, and uh, I, I hope and trust that it won't be the last time. It's been a pleasure to get to know you better. Thanks for joining mm -hmm. us. And thanks to Thank all you. of you who joined us um, on the webinar. We will see you next week. Bye-bye.